I appreciate that. Those chants and that response, that's how you know you're not at Berkeley. So, <laughs> the wave here is okay. At baseball games, it's communism. So today I wanted to do something a little bit different. I've talked a lot about various themes that you see on college campuses and in our politics. I've talked about white privilege and why I think it's nonsense. I've talked about safe spaces and microaggressions and trigger warnings. So if you want to see any of those speeches, all you have to do is go over to YAF's page and you can watch all those speeches. But today I want to do something new. I want to talk about the rising tide of democratic socialism in the country. And I want to talk about all of the myths that are being pervaded by the Democratic Party and the media regarding one of the worst systems of thought ever pervaded, pervaded against the human race. Let's talk a little bit about a woman named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So, so she's the left's newest darling, obviously, and that's why you're booing her. Uh, she's, she's a younger, more charismatic, more diverse version of Bernie Sanders, who of course loves pudding and socialism. And she has launched a wave of enthusiasm for Marxism among members of the Democratic Party. Tom Perez says that she's the new face of the party, and she's receiving, I would say, a slightly outsized share of attention for a lady who had won a grand total of 17,000 votes in a Democratic primary. There are more people watching this live online right now than voted for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> we keep hearing that she is extraordinarily exciting. She's very, very exciting. Right? She's exciting because she can say incredibly stupid things with a straight face and wild enthusiasm in her eyes, and because she radiates sincerity. Of course, so do my two children who are under the age of five, but I wouldn't put them in charge of the nation's economic policy. <laughs> so today I want to talk about democratic socialism and the claims that it makes. In particular, I want to talk about seven particular claims. All of them are wrong, and I think it's necessary for us to know why they are wrong so that we can fight what is going to be the wave of the Democratic Party in the future. The Democratic Party has basically decided that it wants to run on intersectionality with regard to race, on identity politics with regard to race, and on democratic socialism with regard to economics. So the first claim they make is that democratic socialism isn't exactly the same thing as socialism. Now, they can never actually explain why. Right? Or Cortez was asked this. She was asked on national TV, what is the difference between democratic socialism and socialism? And she had no answer. Bernie Sanders has been asked the same thing. Tom Perez has been asked the same thing. Hillary Clinton's been asked the same thing. No one can explain the difference because there is no difference. Democratic socialism is just socialism with a nice word in front of it. Right? It's like how if you add the word sandwich to turd, it is still a turd sandwich. <laughs> if you add the word democratic to socialism, it is still socialism. So let's define what exactly socialism is, and it's kind of important to define the term so that we know what we're talking about. So the basic baseline socialist definition is the, the old ridiculous aphorism from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Socialist programs redistribute. Socialist economies abolish private property and nationalize industry in order to override profit incentives that drive the market. It's important to recognize the difference between these two things. Okay, just because a country has some socialist programs does not make it a socialist country. So, for example, Canada has socialized medicine. Canada is not a socialist country. Canada is a capitalist country with socialist medicine. It's important to separate these two things out because otherwise what you get is, look at Canada, what a socialist paradise where everybody has a really high income and everything's great or the Nordic countries where everybody has a really high income and everything's great, and they have nationalized health care. It's like, right, nationalized health care is the socialist part, and the really high income is the non-socialist part. Right? The part of the living standard that's actually really good, that's the part that's not socialist. And it's important to distinguish these two things, because when you conflate them, you're doing something inaccurate. Right? Socialism requires ab abolition of the profit incentive. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is endorsed by the Democrat Socialists of America and consider herself a member of that group, they have openly stated that they wish to abolish the profit incentive, which is the incentive that has driven the greatest increase in wealth in the history of mankind. Okay, second, folks on the democratic socialist left, they claim that democratic socialism is not, in fact, force. Because it's democratic, right? They use the word democratic, so now it's, not, now it's a democracy, so now it's not force anymore. Right? Just like the Republic of North Korea is actually a republic and doesn't use force anymore. As long as you just say things are th what they are, then, then they, they become those things, right? If you say that a man is a woman, then he becomes a woman. And if you say that a non-republic becomes a republic, then it's a republic. That's just the way that it works. So if, if you say democratic socialism, then the fact that somebody from the government is pointing a gun at your head to rob you, that is not force anymore. Now it's democratic. Right? Now it's democracy. According to Jared Abbott 
of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, steering committee, he says, socialism is about democratizing the family to get rid of patriarchal relations. Good luck with that. Democratizing the political sphere to get genuine participatory democracy. Democratizing the schools by challenging the hierarchical relationship between the teachers of the school and the students of the school. That perhaps is the stupidest idea in the world. I mean, legitimately handing over education to seven-year-olds to democratize the classroom seems kind of dumb. Uh, socialism is the democratization of all areas of life, including but not limited to the economy. But here's the problem. Voting for the use of force is still the use of force. If two-thirds of us vote to rob at gunpoint the other third of the people in this room, that is still force. That is still tyranny. The founders recognized this, which is why they built a system of checks and balances. They were worried about the tyranny of the majority explicitly. They created a constitutional system to prevent exactly this, to prevent the idea that Oh, you said it's democratic. Well, that means it's okay now if we decide to oppress some discrete and insular minority in the language of the Supreme Court with regard to race. Well, that applies with regard to economics too. If you have some people voting to take away other people's money, that doesn't make it democratic and it doesn't make it fair. Which brings us to the third claim that socialists make, which is that socialism is fairer than capitalism. It's a fairer, more moral system. This is the one that gets a lot of folks. You have Bernie Sanders up there and he says things, it, it's so irritating. Bernie Sanders' his entire shtick is he says things that are wrong with the world and then offers no solution. But because they're wrong with the world, people think that he's smart. Okay, Bernie Sanders is not a smart human. And when Bernie Sanders stands up there and he says, it is completely unfair that 1% of the people own 99% of the wealth. And then he suggests that his solution is some pie in the sky nationalization of everything on earth. People say, wow, you know what, what he said there. It's, you're right, it's not fair that some people have three houses and some people have no house at all. Wouldn't it be better if everyone had one and a half houses? Right, we'll just actually cut that third house right down the middle. And sure, there won't be a, a wall that actually protects us from the elements, but at least it'll be fair that way. Socialism is not fair. It is deeply unfair because fairness in our sense of justice actually rests on the premise that there are consequences for actions. Right, this is how we all feel. This is how every human being feels, including people on the left. Right, everyone innately feels that if somebody gets something, something they don't deserve, then that is unfair. If you didn't earn it, but you got it, it feels unfair. The reason it feels unfair is because it basically is unfair, that your earning has to be connected with what you get out of it. Socialism seeks to destroy the system of action and consequences. Now, people mix up charity and socialism. Charity is based on the principle that we ought to help people in need. I agree. We ought to help people in need. That's why I give inside my religious community. That's why conservatives give significantly more money to charity than people on the left. It's why red states give more to charity than people in blue states. People in blue states think they did their job when they paid their taxes. People in red states know they still have a religious obligation in most cases to give money to the needy in their community. A charity is about what I owe to you because I, the, the money in the end doesn't really belong to me. It belongs to God, right? That's what religious people think about charity. It's, it's saying something about my job. But socialism says that if I need something, that creates additional rights in me. Charity is about my duty to you. Socialism is about your rights from me. And what's weird about it is that those rights only accrue the less successful you become economically. So right now, I don't have a right to take your money. But if I were to lose all of my money in a stock market crash, then I would have the right to come and steal your wallet. I fail to see how my economic status impacts my right to take your stuff. I'm exactly the same person. Why exactly should my rights change based on whether I am poor or whether I am rich? Is why I sort of like the biblical system that says the judges are not allowed to discriminate in favor of the rich or in favor of the poor. Socialism says precisely the opposite. We're supposed to discriminate in favor of people who have been less successful financially. This isn't just unfair, by the way. This is the essence of jealousy and greed. I have less, therefore I get to take your things. Right? Socialism violates three of the Ten Commandments. Idolatry, because you're not supposed to worship government, you're supposed to worship God. It violates the prescription against theft, because socialism is indeed theft, even if you vote for the theft. And it violates the prescription against jealousy. That you're not supposed to envy your neighbor. You're not supposed to covet your neighbor's property. That's what socialism is about. That's why everybody is constantly talking about income inequality. Why the hell should you care whether the guy who lives next door is rich? If you're doing great, why do you care if the guy next door to you is rich? If you're living in the second nicest house on Bill Gates' block, you're doing fine. The income inequality between you and Bill Gates is massive, for sure. But are you suffering? The answer is no. The question isn't whether somebody's earning more than you. The question is whether you are suffering. The question is whether you are poor. If you want to make a statement that we all ought to get on board to fight poverty, I'm with you. If you want to say that we ought to fight income inequality, I'm not with you at all. Because I don't think that the rich guy stole from the poor guy. 
In fact, rich people don't get rich by stealing from poor people because it turns out poor people don't have money. The fourth argument made by proponents of democratic socialism is that it's never really been tried. And you hear this one a lot, right? The USSR wasn't socialist, Venezuela wasn't socialist, Cuba wasn't socialist. None of these countries have ever been socialist. It's just like magic. The minute they start sucking and blowing away dissidents, then all of a sudden they're not socialist anymore. It's what we in the, in the commentary business call the no, it's called the no true Scotsman fallacy. This idea that it's never been tried. It's just never been, and if we tried it perfectly, then it would totally work this time, which I got to say, would not be a successful dating strategy, right? If, if like, you're a dude out there, if, if you were trying to get a girl to date you and she knew that you used to dine and ditch your last girlfriend repeatedly at restaurants, and then you're like, no, no, but that wasn't, that wasn't the real me. The real me is the guy who takes you to really nice steakhouses. The real me is the guy who picks you up in a really nice car that I own, and I will never, ever do that to you because that, I've changed. I've changed. Okay, ladies, if you date that guy, you're an idiot. Don't date that guy. Okay, but socialists do this all the time. Okay, we tried the USSR experiment. It only ended with tens of millions of people dead and millions more people imprisoned in gulags and tremendous suffering for nearly a century. Other than that, it was great. Right? Venezuela was not really trying it, right? I mean, the, the full-scale nationalization of the oil industry and the decision to nationalize other key industries and to stack those key industries with cronies of the, of the political party in power and then to inflate the currency to insane numbers and lift tariffs in order to avoid dependency theory. None of that was real socialism. Real socialism is unicorns and rainbows. Real socialism is gun dro gumdrops. It's just, you, real socialism has never been tried. Again, if you believe this, you're a fool. Cuba, Cuba says it's, never, it's not socialist. Cuba knows it's socialist. Right? Socialist countries know they're socialist because they say they're socialist. Okay, but it, it, it's so funny. The same people who will say that a, that a country that declares itself democratic is therefore democratic will not admit that a country that self-identifies as socialist is socialist. If you're a country that self-identifies as socialist, then we will determine whether or not you are socialist depending on whether your country sucks or not. Okay, the fifth claim that democratic socialists make, and this is the one that you're going to hear the most often, is that what real democratic socialism is, it's not Venezuela, it's not Cuba, it's not the USSR, it's Norway. Norway's their favorite one these days, right? It was Denmark a few years ago, and then Denmark had an economic collapse and elected a right-wing government. But now, <laughs> but now it's Norway. Norway is just awesome. As I say, even the, the Prime Minister of Denmark started objecting to this. In 2015, Bernie Sanders was going around talking about how Denmark was just the best place ever. Uh, I guess that was another place he wanted to mooch off a commune and then get kicked out. Uh, and the, uh, and the, the Danish Prime Minister went to Harvard Kennedy School of Government and he said, quote, I know that some people in the U.S. associate the Nordic model with some sort of socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy, okay, which is true. If you look at the Heritage Foundation ranking of economic freedom, what you will find is that the United States is ranked 18th. Ranked above the United States in economic freedom, according to the Heritage Foundation, right? Good conservative folks. Okay, ranked above them. Denmark is ranked 12th. Switzerland is ranked 4th. Sweden is ranked 15th. The Netherlands is ranked 17th. So all of the Nordic countries that the left likes to proclaim are socialist are, in fact, actually capitalist, meaning they have low regulation and they have free trade and they are great places to invest your money. Right? All of these places are prosperous because of capitalism, and the economic problems that they have had are largely attributable to the giant welfare states that they've built on the back of capitalism. The truth about using socialist systems on top of capitalism is that capitalism creates the strength, and then socialism freezes things in place and redistributes everything, which inevitably tends to suck the strength out of the system. Right? You have a growing system that is, that is really bursting at the seams with potential, and then people say, well, we're rich enough, let's redistribute all the gains. So they do that, they redistribute all the gains, and then it turns out that people don't have as much of an incentive to work anymore. And this is why you've seen, for example, there have been some experiments. There's one that was shut down literally today in Canada, I think it's in Ontario. Uh, they, they had a universal basic income experiment in Ontario. They shut it down today because it turned out that when you give people a lot of money to stay home and do nothing, they stay home and do nothing. <laughs> the truth is that all of these countries became wealthy long before they started using all of these socialist methodologies. Also, they became wealthy because they have pretty good cultures there, right? They have high social cohesion in a lot of these Nordic cultures and cultural homogeneity, including a particular focus on work ethic, right? Culture does make a difference in all across the world. Culture makes a difference in how people act differently. Uh, and Nordic populations transplanted to the United States actually do better in the United States than they did back in their home countries. So if it was the system in Norway that made people successful, then why is it that when Norwegians come to the United States, they earn more? 
Right? When Swedish folks come to the United States, when Swedish Americans become Swedish Americans, they actually earn more on average than if they'd stayed home in Sweden. Sweden, which is a, a supposed socialist paradise, it grew because of capitalism, according to an economic scholar named Nima Zanandanji, who's actually from Norway. Between 1870 and 1936, Sweden enjoyed the highest growth rate in the industrialized world. But between 1936 and 2008, the growth rate was only 13th out of 28 industrialized nations. And that is because they started implementing what they called third-way socialism. It was a complete fail. And then they had to elect more right-wing governments to try and walk all of that back. Right? The, the real question when you look at these states is how much of these socialist programs can you, can you place atop the capitalist superstructure? And the answer is some, but not in, not in eternal amount. You can't just pile it on. You can't pile an infinite amount of socialism on top of a structure of capitalism and hope the structure of capitalism holds. That's not how it works. It's also important to note that even if you believe that some of these socialist programs work in places like Norway, even if you really like Norway's education system, for example, the idea that you can extrapolate from Norway to the United States is one of the weirder ideas you know, of people who promote public policy. Norway is a country whose total population is 5.23 million people. I live in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County is 10.2 million people. Los Angeles County is twice the size of Norway. Okay, you can't actually take something that is somewhat working in a, in a culturally homogenous area, which by the way is actually breaking down because what you're seeing is that all of these socialist economies have created welfare states that are not sustainable with the populations they have. This has caused them to bring in a lot of low-wage immigration from abroad, and this is creating high levels of unemployment among those specific immigrants. The, the employment rate among immigrants to the United States is significantly higher than the employment rate for immigrants to Norway, and it's creating all sorts of cultural conflict in places like Norway and in places like Sweden, which is why you're seeing all this anti-immigrant sentiment in these socialist states. They created these socialist welfare states. They brought in a bunch of immigrants to fuel those socialist welfare states. They didn't assimilate any of those people. And then there's all sorts of cultural conflict that is happening because of this.